and welcome back to a very exciting segment and hopefully a video that is going to benefit you in many more ways than actually just doing your live reads. Now, like I've said before, when you're learning how to paint a library, you're really just learning how to use Photoshop or whatever particular program that you're using. So it's, if it's PaintShop Pro or GIMP or whatever else, each one has their differences, some more powerful than the other, different tools, different ways to use the tools. But I do believe they all have a pen tool, it might be called the path tool, or different things. Now, if you just ran away because I said pen tool, get, come back. Now, I want to explain this. It's going to be a long video, most likely, because there's a lot to explain, but there's a lot of benefit to come from the pen tool. And especially for you painters out there that are painting new paints all the time and have to redo certain things here and there, this is going to make you pump out so many more paints because you're going to be able to save your own libraries of your own shapes. So, I'm going to get right into it by pressing Control N on the keyboard for a new image. The width is fine, the height is fine, but I'm going to change the color to background color, which is the bottom color here. Press OK. I'm going to go full screen and I'm going to go right into this zoom wise to 100%. And I want to create a new layer. So I'm going to go ahead down here to the create a new layer shortcut. I'll call this box. And I already have the marquee tool selected. I'm going to draw a square. Now this is a rectangle, but I want a square. So I'm going to hold down shift while I drag this out and it's going to keep my proportions totally constrained. And I'm going to fill that with my foreground color, which is alt backspace and click somewhere to deselect that. I, I want another layer, but this time I'm going to use the keyboard shortcut control shift N and it brings up the new layer properties and I can name it right here to circle. Hit OK. And now I'm going to change my tool to the elliptical marquee tool. And this time I'm going to add something into the mix when I drag out my selection. I'm still going to constrain the proportions to keep my circle right, but I'm going to start from the middle, start dragging, and I'm going to hold down Alt. And that's going to make it born from the center or from the point that I started it's going to make it grow from there. Hold down shift, constrain those proportions, get that circle roughly in here. And I want to change my color to, let's say, just a blue. Okay. And alt backspace. Bam. Deselect that with control D. And now I'm looking at my background color, my square, and my circle on top of my square. There's a lot of false information out there on the internet. This, I've seen a lot of tutorials on YouTube, Vimeo, and even some paid sites. And there are some people that will say that you can't create a vector graphic in Photoshop. You would have to use Illustrator or, I don't know, Flash or whatever. And that's not true at all. Yeah, you can export certain things via Illustrator and you could do all kinds of cool stuff. But you could also do it right here in Photoshop. Why leave? Well, let's look at our circle and our square here. And let's think about what a vector graphic is. A vector graphic, the more we zoom in, and or we get the more that we resize that particular image, it is staying with whatever resolution you have, and it's constantly keeping its smooth, its smoothness, without becoming pixelated and jagged. So I'm going to go ahead and show you that by taking my circle, I'm going to hit Control T on the keyboard. That layer is selected, Control T, and we can see that these little things come around it, and these little handles. I can go ahead and shrink it this way. I could shrink it in with this handle. I can do both with this outside corner. And if you don't like it, you can hit Escape. But what I'm going to do is, again, I want it to shrink down to the center, so I'll press Alt, and I'm going to hold down Shift to keep its, you know, constrained proportions. I'm going to go really small here, right about there, and I'm going to press OK. Now here's my logo that I created in FS9 or wherever, and now I'm bringing this circle over to NGX, and I want that circle, but I need to make it bigger. I need it to fit this door, say. So again, I'm going to bring it over. I'm going to hit Control T to make it bigger, and I'm going to now drag this out, press Alt and Shift, and bring it back up. 
Now we just created this, and look how terrible it looks. What the hell is that? Is that a blue Charlie Brown? Come on. This is so embarrassing. Well, there's your image that you just created. Yeah, you just used all the data. In other words, you told it what color to be, you told it to be a circle, yet it's already forgotten that. And it did so because you created from scratch, you started off creating a rasterized image. Now, I want to go ahead and press V for the movement tool so I can delete these two layers by pressing delete. Let's show you with using text. So I'm going to change my text to white beforehand, and I'm going to go ahead and set my font to say, so actually I want to go to say 172. And I'm going to click here and start typing, hello, guys and gals. And there we go. Now I can move this by pressing V to get my movement tool and get that back out here. So fonts are technically vector. So if I were to zoom into this, what happened? I'm still getting jaggies. You know, it's not looking quite right. You know, it shouldn't do that. But it's doing that because even fonts in Photoshop aren't really going to be necessarily vector images as you're zooming in and zooming out. Nothing really is. But the beauty of these letters or numbers or whatever I had here is if I were to go ahead and stretch this down, way down, like we just did with the circle, and then later on bring that back up and say, well, I want these to be bigger. Whoops. You can see that it retained everything because it has that information. Now let's say, for instance, that I were to change this from its vector state to a raster image. I would do so by right-clicking the layer, saying Rasterize Type. And now it is no longer text. I can't click this and edit the text. It's now been converted to a raster image. So now if I were to go ahead and constrain this, or to shrink it down, hit Enter, bring it into a different PSD, and now bring it back to its original size. Whoa, holy crap. That ain't good. So hopefully you're now, you understand what a rasterized or bitmap looks like. So I'm going to delete that. Now let's go ahead and select the pen tool by pressing P for papa, or pen. And I'm going to go up to the toolbar here, and we have different tools. We have a path tool, we have a fill pixels, and we have the shape layers. We're going to use the shape layers, but first, let's talk about what a path is. Whether you're using this one or this one, you're going to have the same basic principles. They both use paths, and these paths are going to later help us retain our information just as the font did, or as a vector graphic. If I click here, you'll see this little box. That is my starting point, or my anchor point, that some people might refer to as a node or a vortex and so many different things. It's called an anchor point, and as long as you understand what it is, that's all that matters. So I can now continue to click, like I was using, say, like my lasso tool. And I can just come down here and do all these different shapes. And when I'm totally done and ready, I can go to my starting point. And you see how it switches to a circle? Or you have that circle pop out? That's saying it's going to close off your selection. So I click that. And now I have my path. Well, one thing about the pen tool, as you're going to notice, is it's embedded into my background. And it's also a temporary thing. Unless I save this and later do other things with it, like fill it or whatever else, it's, it's not going to give us the same result that we want in our paints. So, yeah, there is a path there. If I go to paths, I can see the working path. But this path, again, it's temporary. It's not going to stay there. So what are paths and what are paths used for? There are a million different ways, but just to give you one example, just using this path tool, 
If I were to click here, starting my anchor point, and then I were to come over, say, here, and click and hold the mouse button down and drag, all of a sudden we get this handle. And that handle is called a bezier handle. And you have a curve, which is called the bezier curve. So as I drag this out and move it around, you could see that I can now shape my curve. I could use this as a tracing tool, which is a very effective tracing tool if used right and a great way to practice the pen tool. So I let go of the mouse and here I have this curve and let's say I want to use this curve and I want to create that to be my roof and I want to I want to make a building here, a hangar. So I want to come down below here because I want my wall of my hangar, that being the roof. And I want a straight line. So I'm going to come down below this anchor point and click. And out pops a boob. Well, I don't want the boob. Not here, anyway. So what do I do about that boob? Or what caused that boob to be created? Let me undo that. Here's what happens to a lot of painters when they're making their stripes, their lines, their designs, their logos, whatever. They click, they drag, and they're like, they're fighting to try to straighten this out. And they're using all sorts of methods to try to correct the boob. Well, there's nothing you can really do to fix it. Not if you want to retain, you know, everything. It's just not going to happen. You could stretch this all day long. It's not going to work. So I'm going to undo that. And what is causing that? Well, wherever I click, it is going from about the same point of your handle, which is the halfway handle, and saying, all right, well, he's clicking here, so the handle is X amount of distance from the anchor point. So take half of that and continue our curve as follows and meet up with him at his next anchor point. So you're telling this curve that you want it to do what it's doing. It's behaving because you told it to behave that way with leaving your Bezier handle as is. So the correct way to do it, or to avoid such a problem, is to, before you go on to your next anchor point, you want to change your Bezier handle. So you do that in many different ways. You can go over to the flyout menu and you could choose your fly down here, convert point tool, or you could just press and hold alt on the keyboard and you see how it changes to the arrowhead. You can now click your Bezier handle, and if you notice, as I move it, nothing's happening. It's not changing my shape. So, if I move that right to the center, and now I come down to create my next point, bam, I have a straight line, or wherever I clicked. And now I can come over here to do the same thing here, and try to match that up, and now I can go ahead and close that off, and there's the outline of my hanger. So let's back up to the first step for a second here, or not the first step, but here. I have the Bezier handle, and I don't want the boob. Rather than having to do that with the handle, I can just press and hold Alt, and I can click the actual anchor point. And that will set it to its center, and now I can continue on and do as we just did. And there we go, I have my outline of my hanger. Okay? So what can a path be used for? Well, real quick, before I start to making, you know, this video longer than it needs to be, let's say I selected the text tool, and I had a logo and I wanted my text to follow it. I wanted it to wrap around there. How many people here create one letter at a time and then just use the tr free transform tool or other methods to rotate that text around to make it appear like it's following that curve? Well, the easy way to do it is to just follow a path. So if we notice, if you watch my cursor as I get close to the path, you see that? Now that's helping us or telling us that it's going to follow the path if we click it there. So I'm going to click there. Let me lower my font size to say 21 or so. And I'm going to start typing just random letters. And look at how nicely it's following my path. So it's going to do that however long I have my path, and it's going to flip it upside down where it needs to be upside down. It's going to go, you know, just crazy and do everything all by itself. So there we go. I'm done here. Click T, and there's my text in the form of the path.
Now let's start to use this the way we're going to want to use it. And I'm going to go ahead and drag this down to the trash. No more path. If I go into my work paths here, there it is. I can bring that selection back up, but I don't want that. I don't want the paths anymore at all. I want to create a new one from scratch. I'm going to click the pen tool and shapes. And I'm going to now create a shape of, let's say, this is going to be pretty terrible. Let's say I just want to do a star. Let's not even say we're doing curves. I'll just kind of like create these points. And what happened there? Well, it's automatically filling in your anchor points to where it thinks that you're going to want to go with it as you go with whatever color that you have set for your foreground color. So I'll ignore that. And I'm going to just come over here and continue my star. And do do do. And do -bo boom. And don't mind my humming. It works for me. And wow, this is really terrible. <laughs> Gotta love that star. But that's the beauty of these paths or anchor points or using the pen tool. So I'm going to close that off, click here, and now I have my path. Now I know right now you're looking at it saying, what are you talking about, Dan? You got all these jaggedy edges. Don't look too vector graphic like to me. Well, right now you're seeing the work path. And to get rid of that, you go up here to view and you go down to show and there's your target path. So you can use the keyboard shortcut also, Control Shift H. And now there is my vector graphic. There is my image that is going to retain its perfectness. No matter how much or zoom it in or make it smaller or make it larger or whatever I do, I can make this as large as I can possibly grab it, hit enter, and let's go down here and look at the crisp detail. Let me move this around so you can get a better idea of what's going on here. So again, you're seeing everything down to the smallest point, to the biggest point, and it's still smooth. And that's what a vector is, or that's what the vector image benefit is for us. So let's go ahead and zoom way out here, and let's learn the next step about working with our vectors. Now, after we've created one, we have the path there. So what can we do with that? Well, we can add anchor points to it by selecting the Add Anchor Point tool. Once we select that, you'll see that our path is back. And that's so we can see it. So as we move over our path, the pen tool changes to that plus. I can now change, I can now click on anywhere on the path and add more anchor points to it. And this is something I do often on things that I created a long time ago and I update them. I might add something to it to change certain things. Now you also have another tool called the direct selection tool. By default, you're probably looking at the path selection tool. So click its fly out, go down to direct select. And now you can click on each individual node or anchor point, or you can click on a particular part of the actual star here or the path, and it will automatically choose its handle if it has one. And you also notice that over here in the layer panel, it created a new layer when we did this. So the shape is its own layer. Well, I want to show you how to do it with a circle. So I'm going to go ahead and delete this. I'm going to start over from scratch and I'm going to do a circle-ish type of thing. Actually, I'm going to do a like a teardrop to show you the handles a little bit more. So I'm going to start from the top, click a point. I'm going to come down roughly center and even if I'm off, Just like we learned in the gradient tool, if I hold down shift, and even if I'm this far off, if I hold down shift and click, look where it put my node perfectly center. Okay? So knowing that, let's do that same thing, holding down shift, but hold the mouse button down so I can get this Bezier curve handle. And I'm going to go ahead and create just some kind of little bit of curve here, something like that. And again, by using shift, I can tell it to line up perfectly straight there, lock it in there. So it's going to lock in on all your major angles. 
Now to explain what I talked about before, this distance here and how it's being used, if I wanted to now just close this off without creating any kind of more anchor points, I can just go right up to here, close off my graphic, and it's going to use that information because it's taken the information that I used on the last anchor point, and it's going to use that to the new one. So maybe that will better help you understand what's going on. So I'm going to press Control shift h so I can hide that path, and there we go. Now I have a curve, or a curved shape, and as I zoom in, zoom out, do all kind of crazy things with this thing, no matter what I do to it, it's still going to retain its shape. So now if I bring this into something later, or I created a logo, and I, you know, did more and more things to it, and let's go astronomically huge. Its curve is still perfect. It's very crisp. It's awesome. So now let's say I had the direct selection tool. I'm going to press A for that. A as an apple. And now if I click somewhere where the path is, out pops the path. But now if I click it again, because our, ours was hidden, that's why it's just showing it to you now, out pops the Bezier handle. So if I clicked over here, there's that handle. So now, by doing that, by finding the handle that I want to manipulate, and that's what I'm doing with this direct selection tool, either the handles or the nodes themselves, I can say take this node later, and I can move that point up. Let me um, go ahead and actually transform this down a little bit. I'm going to zoom back in because right now we're down to 50. And the path is being shown, which is why you're seeing it the way it is. But I'm going to leave the path there press my direct selection tool, click a certain spot, and then now I can see the node itself. I can see this node. Depending on which one I want, I can go ahead and say this node right here, and I want to change the location of it and bring that closer up. And now I have more of like a guitar pick look to it. I can say grab this Bezier curve and maybe change the outline a little bit. You know, so for the most part, what I'm trying to say is this is forever there. You know, this is however you want it. I'm going to leave the teardrop. I kind of like this looking like a teardrop. So I'm going to get it to about perfectly center. And you'll be amazed at what you can make using other techniques. Like if you want, you can bring out the grid, go into show grid. And now you have something to reference. You can also pop out the ruler by pressing control H. Now you have a ruler. So there are all kinds of things you can do here. One of my particular favorites is the fact that now we can get onto the all important fact that you can save this as your own shape. And that statement alone, people probably don't even understand that Photoshop has. So if I have the pen tool selected, I can go over to its path, right click it, and choose Define Custom Shape. And now I can name it, let's say, Tear Drop. Now where to go? Well, this is the part to where people probably don't even know exists. But down here you have a shape tool. Okay, and it has different flyouts for making different things. So your shape isn't going to be there. Your shape is going to be up here. And we have all these different shapes by default, and people probably don't even know about them. So let's say I select... Um, Let's go with the light bulb. If I click and drag somewhere, out comes this new vector graphic. And again, it looks pixelated because the path is showing. Control Shift H and it's no longer showing. And I can still do the same thing with this. I could make it small, I can make it large. You know, it doesn't matter. It's not going to lose its shape because the paths are there and it's going to show it what it needs to be or it's going to give that information to it and update that constantly. And the beauty of this is you could take one of these existing images or shapes and you could also adjust its paths. So you might find something that you want to work from and you can do that as well. You could change its shape and come up with a logo this way. So I'm, I'm pretty sure that this one part of it just knowing that alone will maybe 
help you in creating your own logos. But now let's take this even further. Let's say I want to create my own library because I pump out all these paints and I'm so busy with all these paints and I just want to have my United Airlines, my American Airlines, everything that I've spent so long creating always forever with me in Photoshop. Well, let's go back to the pen tool so we can get this fly out. Let's click on the shape icon and let's go over to that fly out again and first of all where's our teardrop but down here if you mouse over it you will get the teardrop and I could always bring that out later at another time. I create multiple ones. I could change their shapes and sizes and honestly I don't even want to go there yet but I could even create a brush out of all these custom shapes. And this should really get your gears already turning when you're talking about effects later or how to quickly paint like lots of dirt or lots of chipped paint. Do you know what I mean? I mean this is the core behind so much that you could do, so much power in Photoshop. So let's go ahead and add our teardrop to our own library. Now in other versions of Photoshop you might have the ability to do this easier, but in Photoshop CS3 anyway you have to kind of do it a kind of cheesy way. So now here I have other shapes that I made, which are really nothing. I have a pumpkin, I have a ripper, which was more just for the path, and then I even have over here I have dog turd, and that, if I click on that we can see that it doesn't really look like dog turd, it's more like a bobsled. So anyway, I'm going to go ahead, go into my shape, to the flyout menu of it, and I'm going to go down here and save shapes, and I'm just going to call this Dan. Now before I hit save, I want to know where this is because I want to back this up. I want to be able to make sure I have a copy of this. So it's Dan App Data Roaming Adobe, Adobe Photoshop CS3 Presets Custom Shapes. So later on you can go find that. Real quick, if you don't have show hidden folders and files option on, then you're going to want to turn it on to be able to see your app data folder. So I named it Dan. I'm going to click save and now I have it saved. So now I can go ahead and I can go through this and I don't want, I want mine to just be my logos. So I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to say, this one, or I can go to each one of these and say delete shape, delete shape, and just work my way all the way down until I'm done and I have nothing but my own shapes. And these are fine, these are still there, that's why we saved it. Actually we should probably rename that one default, but you can restore these simple enough. So once this is finally done, and we get this exactly how we want it, now we can go ahead and resave this. And I will call this one Logos, or let's say Dan's Logos. Okay. And just like our last thing using the layer mask, you could change the color to each one of these just by simply having it selected and changing the actual color and filling it. Bam. So actually I didn't have my light bulb selected. That would be this layer here. So now I have it selected. Hide that path. And ba-boom. So that should really get your gears turning. And that should really hopefully hopefully explain the pen tool a little bit better. So practice the pen tool, learn how to do it, maybe do something like, who knows, go, go ahead and go to the internet and let's say images, Apple, drag this into Photoshop, V for the movement tool, Move this. I'm going to go ahead and delete all these layers. Delete these two. And here's my 
little apple here and now I can actually blow this up and use the pen tool just to trace it out. Here's my starting point. Another point, follow this curve around, getting it to right about there. Close this off, continue on. And before you know it, you're going to be really good at the pen tool. I'm not going to do the leaf here, but I'm no expert on the pen tool. I know a lot about it, but it doesn't mean I'm an expert. I'll not do that because that just that was pretty terrible. And I'll just wrap this up real fast to show you that it can be used for a pretty decent tracing tool. That was pretty terrible. Going a little too fast maybe for my own good, huh? And now I can close this off up here and get that last little bit of stretch and maybe go ahead and even change to my direct selection tool and go down here and maybe nudge this one over, move it, and maybe re-sample that handle. And there we go. Not bad for a few seconds of tracing. All right. So I'm really hopeful that that kind of made things simple for you to get going with the pen tool. And you should be making a lot more than stripes before you know it. And in our next tutorial, we will go ahead and knock out that stripe. See you then.